Mr. Landon, you mistook a muscle's head me about the last relationship with John Keats. If only I'd realized how inquisitive Captain Medwin would be, then I never would have invited him. But I have. And there he is, with his equally eager and devoted friend, Caroline de Crespigny, <laughs> taking tea in my sitting room, anxious to pry into the most precious secrets of my heart. Mr. Lennon, was Mr. Keats an admirer of your wife? Why, yes, I believe he was. It is now more than 20 years since John Keats's death. I thought he had perished in obscurity and that his name would rest in the anonymity he had foreseen when he asked that his epitaph would be. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. But in the last year or two, public interest in John has been growing. And this evening, Captain Medwin has asked me to give him some notes on John's life to include in the biography he is writing of his cousin, Percy Bysshe Shelley. I must admit that it is difficult for me to remain silent when people speak of John ignorantly and even maliciously. You see, I met John when I was only just 18. Too young to understand fully the great and many-sided nature of the first man I had fallen in love with until it was already too late. It had all begun on a bright June day in 1818. It's so easy for me to picture that day when I arrived for the very first time at that little white house in Hampstead. Here we are, children. Wentworth Place, a home for the summer. Sam and Margaret take the dog out with you into the garden, but be sure he doesn't do any damage to the flower beds. Why, it's a very handsome house. It looks almost too large for us. Well, we shall occupy only this half of it. We came in through the side entrance, our entrance, and the front door leads to Mr. Dilk's part of the house. He and Mr. Brown built it together. Does Mr. Dilk light his heart during the summer too? No, he and his wife will be here with us. They have one little boy, Charlie. He's too young for us, Sam, but he'll be good company for Margaret. I'm told he's a dear little boy. Come along now. There's much work to be done before we go to bed tonight. I like it. It's pretty and comfortable and feels like home. It will when we get some of our things round us. Fanny, dear, step outside and keep an eye on Sam and Margaret, will you please? No! the eldest girl. Don't you find her elegant? She's a well enough looking young woman. Let's hope she's as intelligent. As long as she's clever enough to find a good husband, that's all her mother will worry about. Have you met Mrs. Brown yet? Brown tells me she's a sensible, amiable woman. No, but I shall call upon her sometime today. I shall enjoy having another woman in the house. Is that Charlie? He should be working on that Latin I set for him yesterday. Oh, Charles, I sent him into the garden. I wanted him to see some sunshine in such a lovely morning. It's no good for him always to be studying. Who's that other child? Must be Margaret, Mrs. Brown's youngest. But I haven't wasted much time in making friends. Doubtless, she will provide another excellent excuse for Charlie to neglect his studies. Hmm? Mm. <laughs> Mrs. Dilk, how kind of you to call. Won't you come in? This is my eldest daughter, Fanny. How do you do? How do you do? Sam and young Margaret are playing in the garden. She's a friendly little soul and has already made herself known to your boy. Oh, Charlie is full of her. I'm so glad he has someone to play with. It's lonely for a boy with no brothers or sisters. He won't be lonely for the next few months. That is certain. <laughs> How quickly you've made yourself at home. Do you think you're going to like Wentworth Place? Oh, I'm sure we shall be very happy here. Mr. Brown seems to be a house-proud man. Everything was so clean and in order, which is more than I can say for many of the lodgers.
lodgings we have taken. Ah, yes. Mr. Brown, he is, likes his creature comforts. He's one of those practical bachelors, very useful and handy about the house. <clears throat> uh, he's traveling in Scotland at the moment, I believe. Ah, yes, as usual in summer, he's gone stopping off on one of his walking tours. How very enterprising of him. Well, better him than me, my husband says. Mr. Dilk has no taste for hard roads, poor food, and damp beds. But in spite of his liking of the better things of life, Mr. Brown will put up with all these discomforts for the sake of scenery. Good thing he's a well set up and robust man. <coughs> uh, he's not traveling alone, is he? No, this time he's taken with him Mr. John Keats, one of our Hampstead neighbors, and a very good friend of my husband's. He was eager to go, full of enthusiasm for traveling and seeing the sights. It's, I just can't think it is wise, poor young man. Oh? Well, he's the eldest of three orphan boys. Twenty-two, I suppose he must be. The second brother, George, was married just a week or two ago to a charming young girl of 16. Miss Georgiana Wiley, she was. I had an idea. At one time, John Mother fancied her for himself. But George won her, and now he's taken her off to America, where he hopes to make a more settled and prosperous life. Seems dreadfully risky to me, but Mr. Dilk much admires their enterprise. None of this is boring to you, I hope, Mrs. Brown. I know I have a tendency to rattle off. Please continue, Mrs. Dilk. We are most 